Hi everyone. Hi everyone. I'm back on webcam. Um, this is my bedroom when I was in high school. Also, I want to be on webcam one last time with this hair. I'm going to get a haircut um, probably tomorrow. Unit 5, <clears throat> video 2. We are up to reaction 5C. 5C is called halogenation. We had hydrohalogenation. What is halogenation? Halogenation is now we're adding two halogens. And they're going to be the same type of halogen. If I have... Let's start with... Mm, that's going to be an interesting molecule. Let's start with that. Okay. And to do halogenation, you want to add typically either Br2 or Cl Cl2. So it's going to be a bromination or a chlorination. And you do want to use a solvent. The solvent should be a chlorinated solvent. For instance, CHCl3, which is chloroform. Or you could use CH2Cl2, which is dichloromethane. The solvent actually doesn't add any atoms to the product, or to the, sorry, to the starting material. Uh, the solvent is important, though, because in our next reaction, we're going to contrast that by using water instead of a chlorinated solvent. In this case, we have two halogens. The good news about this is when you saw the last thing we talked about in video one, we talked about rearrangement. The mechanism for this doesn't go through a carbocation, so there's no carbocation rearrangement. And there's another pretty cool thing about this. The, the pretty cool thing about this is that uh, we don't form any hmm, we don't form any constitutional isomers because we're adding two bromines. It doesn't matter if we switch them, right? It doesn't end up being an isomer. So there's no Markovnikov's rule either. No Markovnikov's rule. Well, that means that it is non, hmm, should I say it, non visual selective. You know, visual selectivity is you form, you, you could possibly form constitutional isomers and you choose one set over the other. So Markovnikov's rule is a way to describe the visual selectivity. Okay. So it's non visual selective because there is no Markovnikov's rule. And let me just check this text real quick. Okay. Uh, non regional selective. Uh, stereo selective, though, is a different story. So it is stereo selective. And the terminology to describe its stereo selectivity is uh, sin addition. Oh, duh. Anti addition. A new term for most of us. Now, the thing is, um, oh, this is a good example. I'm glad I picked this example. We form two chiral carbons there and there. So let me show you what anti-addition means. Because this is not the final, final answer. This is without stereochemistry. And because we have chiral carbons, and because there's stereoselectivity, we are going to have to worry about wedges and dashes. If I ask you with stereo when appropriate. It's appropriate only when you have chiral carbons. So check this out. We have this. Um, sorry, my, my hair is distracting me. Um, anti addition. I'm going to arbitrarily choose this top bromine to be dash. What that tells me is that the second bromine is wedge, anti addition. Plus, the bromine on the top wedge, the bromine on the bottom, dash. So we have this. Both of these cases indicate that the bromines added anti. The two we are atoms added anti. Okay. 
Now, let me just uh, close the door real quick. You might wonder. Mm, that doesn't follow the English. Selective means I thought I'd choose one stereoisomer over the other. I'm drawing a mixture. This is still racemic. How is this selective? How is this selective when uh, you're telling me that I make a 50-50 mixture of these two uh, enantiomers, right? These are still enantiomers, 50-50. It's selective because there are two stereoisomers that I'm not drawing. What are those two stereoisomers? Those are the ones where the bromines add on the same side. So I'm not drawing on purpose these two. That one and this one. When you're drawing wedges and dashes, fill in your wedges, please. Don't don't draw me a skinny triangle. Okay, or an empty skinny triangle. You gotta fill in those wedges. That's why it's selective. That's why it's particularly stereoselective. These are all stereoisomers of each other. Like these are these two are diastereomers. Right? These two are diastereomers. These two are enantiomers. But anyway, you're not drawing these two. So when I say that selective, you're choosing a set of stereoisomers over preferentially another set. Now, let me give you one more example and then the mechanism. Because the mechanism will will explain why mechanism will explain why we have anti-addition. So this is kind of subtle again because you have to look at these on a case by case basis. You can't memorize I mean, you can memorize the general product, which is adding two bromines, but if you want to get that A, to separate the A's from the B's, you want to realize that when I draw this product with stereochemistry, the only chiral carbon I have actually is this one, second from last. And this carbon at the end is not chiral. So honestly, I don't know just from the products whether these added anti or on the same side. By the way, I, I know I'm going to say this term over and over again. This is called syn addition, when the two things, two atoms add on the same side. So you have anti-addition and you have syn addition. I can't really tell because the second carbon here, if this carbon is not chiral, I don't know how these bromines added. There's no relative orientation between these two. But I do know that this carbon is chiral and the bromine can add from the front or the back. Why is that the case? You know, double bonds are flat. So you do have 50-50 front and back. It's just that in this carbon, it's not chiral and we don't know whether this initially added as a wedge or a dash. But because that is a chiral carbon, we do have, there's still an antivers, right? Two antivers. Okay, so it is true that this reaction is non ratio selective because you're adding two of the same things. It is true that this reaction is stereoselective. Halogenation is stereoselective. It's just that in this case, you don't observe that, or you, you, it's impossible to observe when you're just looking at the, the products. Okay. The mechanism that I'm going to uh, show you it's going to be based off of this reaction. I think I can fit it on the bottom of this page. Very simple alkene. When you draw the mechanism, again, for me, no wedges and dashes, which is great. Because I'm only concerned about do you know why these atoms go where they go? The thing is, the first step is kind of weird looking. I'm a little bit unsteady about the mechanism, so I'm going to draw all the lone pairs. Okay. You can never go wrong by drawing all the lone pairs. You can never go wrong with an alkene reaction mechanism when you use a pi bond to attack an atom. Okay. When this pi bond attacks and makes a bond to bromine, this bond breaks and you're kicking out a bromide. This bromine is going to be on the 
carbon and this bromine leaves. But here's a tricky step. You want to remember that the first step of halogenation is three mechanism arrows, and you're going to take one of the lone pairs, and you're going to come back and hit one of the carbons. Technically, you should hit the more substituted carbon. Um, that's only because I won't get into it too much, but electronically, this has is building up a bigger partial positive charge. The secondary carbon has a bigger, more stable partial positive charge than the primary. It's almost as if you're following the rules of carbon cation stability. If you draw the arrow from the lone pair to this carbon, I probably would not take off points. The product is going to look super, super strange. Thankfully, there's no wedges and dashes on mechanisms, but that's your product. Give me one second. Um, actually, let me pause this. I gotta return this text. But oh, how about this? While I'm paused, and while you're paused, let me draw you the, the next set of errors. First of all, there's a charge missing in this molecule. Find the charge and put the charge. Second of all, draw me the result of these two arrows. Okay. Your task, while I'm gone for a minute, is find the plus... Oh. Okay, it's a plus charge. Find where the plus charge goes on this molecule, and then draw me the result once these two mechanism arrows are uh, have done their, their thing. Okay, I believe it's continuing the recording. The plus charge is here on the bromine. Why do I know that? Formal charge equals valence electrons minus sticks plus balls. So we have a valence of 7 minus sticks plus balls. On that bromine, there are two sticks plus four balls. One, two, three, four. So you can have both balls of the lone pair. One, two, three, four. Seven minus six equals plus one. So there's your plus charge. If you want to do this for bromine, I know people know this already. Seven minus no sticks plus eight balls. That's minus one. All right. If you made a mistake, correct it in red pen. Don't erase it. Okay, don't erase it. Uh, because that's a charge that people tend to forget. Do you have to draw the lone pairs? You don't have to draw the lone pairs. But if you draw one of the lone pair, you have to draw all of the lone pairs on that atom. So this is what's happening. This bromine that comes in attaches to this carbon right here. Nope. Nope, no, 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 no. I, I have the wrong number of carbons. That bromine that just added is on this middle carbon, right? This carbon right here. And the, I'm going to draw it up. It doesn't matter if I draw it up or down. It just looks better this way, the angles. But this bromine, see this bromine here stays connected to this carbon. This says you're breaking the bond to this middle carbon. So the bromine that was initially there now is at the end only. That's the product we have predicted when you do halogenation on this molecule. Only two steps. It's just that the first step is really wacky, especially this third arrow here, which you don't want to forget. The other thing is that you make a triangle. So this is the what I like to call the triangle uh, mechanism. And there's going to be several triangle mechanisms. Okay. Don't say that in, other, in front of other chemists. This is a three-membered ring um, intermediate, three-membered ring intermediate, but I think of it as triangle. Um, the, thing, the next thing is, there, there are a couple of important points here. That bromine comes from the opposite side of where this bromine is pointing. So I'm not drawing any wedges and dashes, okay? But maybe I'll show you on the next page. But the incoming bromine minus attacks from opposite side of the bromine in triangle. That's why this is anti-addition.
That's why this is anti-addition. Now, I'm not going to take the time to make models, okay? But I will draw. First of all, this is the full mechanism. This is what you have to know how to do. But let me draw you some wedges and dashes to, to kind of prove that the bromine is attacking from the opposite side, thus giving uh, anti-addition. Okay. I'm going to try to keep this under 30 minutes. This and the next reaction. Okay. Uh, let's take this molecule here. I know it's a little more complicated, but this molecule will definitely be better to illustrate anti-addition. Okay. Uh, Br2 or Cl2. And what have I used? I've used chloroform. I used dichloromethane last time. And this one is going to be carbon tetrachloride. Okay. Chlorinated solvent. And one of our products is going to be this. And I'll allow you to write an antimer if you know that this is racemic instead of drawing it out. Okay. So when that first bromine that makes a triangle comes in, okay. If my ring is flat, I'm going to draw this a little bit bigger. That bromine can either be above the page or below the page because the double bond is flat. So you have a 50 50 having the triangle dash away from us or towards us. By putting the bromine dash from the behind, you're pushing this methyl group forward because it has to be tetrahedral. The next thing, Br minus coming in. I haven't explained why it attacks this more substituted carbon. Okay, but I'll put a note here. I'll explain that in just a bit. Now, does it matter for the final product? No, because both carbons have bromine. But you, for the mechanism, it does matter that you attack the correct carbon. You notice here, the bromine attack the more substituted carbon. Oops, more substituted carbon. I'll get to why in just a bit. But that carbon now has five bonds, so you have to break this bond to open up the ring. And when you open up the ring, look what you have. Okay, so this is tricky. That bromine is still connected to the, the bottom carbon, the carbon at four o'clock. And it's still dash. Nothing happened at this stereo center. Sorry, I'm going to use the word chirocarbon. Chirocarbon. When the bromine comes in, do you notice that this bromine is pointing away from us? So it's kind of, bromine's big, and it's blocking the attack from the back side, from, the, from, the, from behind the paper. So it's actually, more le it's actually less crowded coming from the front. So the front in this case, or the opposite, in other words, is the wedge. So you're purposefully putting the bromine wedge, which is the opposite of this dash. Because the bromine dash is blocking, like, for instance, underneath the page. So there's a bromine, like, underneath the page over here. So the, this bromine comes from the, from the front, or the, from the top. When that happens, you are pushing this methyl group to the back. Okay, you can't have wedge wedge when you have a drawing like this. Okay, so you have that. That's one of the enantiomers. It's the one that I drew up here. Okay, why? Okay, hopefully I've kind of convinced you that that bromine coming in has to be the opposite of the bromine part of the triangle. All right, that talks about stereo selectivity. Why does it attack here? Because um, this is not the full answer, but this will get us through this exam. More substituted carbons can carry a bigger partial positive charge. Thus, it is more attractive to the nucleophile. See, this carbon is connected to three other carbons. One, two, three. 
So you can almost think of it as a tertiary carbon. This carbon is attacked, attached to two carbons. This is secondary. You know with carbocations, tertiary is more stable than secondary. We're not forming any carbocations, though, in this mechanism. But we are starting to build up charge. So I don't have a full plus charge. I, I put partial. But the partial charge on this carbon, and I can draw it here, is much bigger than the partial charge on this carbon right there. That's why it's, this is more attracted to the more substituted side, because the more substituted carbon can carry that charge better. That is reaction 5C. I want to do reaction 5D in the same video because it is the same mechanism except for the last part where we're adding water instead of second bromine. So I will still use this ring because now there is some mutual selectivity. No shortcuts. This is called halohydrin formation. Halohydrin formation. Halo for halogen. Hydrin is a historical name for OH, a hydroxyl group. Here's the difference. Br2. So far, that's the same. Alkene plus Br2, we should do halogenation. But when I change the solvent to specifically water, water is going to be the attacker now. Remember when water attacked with our hydration reaction? When water attacked, it ultimately became OH. And here's a Br. So instead of two Brs, we have an OH and a Br. Here's the regio selectivity. Now we have re now we have regio selectivity because we're adding two different things. It's regio selective, and there's no hydrogen, so we're not going to use Markovnikov's rule. There's no carbocation, so we're not going to use Markovnikov's rule. We're going to say here the OH on more substituted carbon of the double bond. Okay, so if we have another substitute carbon on the ring, those don't count. Since there's no arrangement, we know for sure we're adding something to each of these two carbons. Okay, no rearrangement. Don't have to worry about that. That's regional selectivity. Stereo. Mm. We have a Br2 here. I think we're going to do anti-addition again. Because it's very similar, it starts out almost it starts out identically to our 5C reaction. Now we're going to have that triangle, that triangle with the bromine plus. Oh, by the way, now um, if I want to do stereochemistry, I notice that these two are chiral carbons, and yes. This is a minimum of doing well on the exam, is to know how to draw these stereoisomers. Anti-addition, OH, Br plus, still anti-addition, but now the OH is wedge and the Br is dash. mechanism. I'm going to use this simple alkene. Actually, I'm going to use the same alkene that we did for the previous reaction halogenation, this one right here. Again, if you visualize, all you're doing is adding bromines on both of these carbons and we get this molecule over here. Oh, I hope this Java doesn't screw things up. Um, Okay, great. Because I am, we, we are on a roll. The mechanism. Now's a great time to practice. Draw me the mechanism to make the triangle. Okay. Go ahead and pause this video and then draw me the mechanism and the results. All right, so we're back. This is always the first arrow, pi bond attack. Now this one leaves, almost like you're attacking HCl. 
right? And this was an H and this was a CL and the CLDs. The weird thing about this mechanism is that you have, I don't know, to call this back attack or whatever, to the more substituted carbon. This is exactly what we did in the previous mechanism. See, right there. This is for 5C. This is for 5D. Same exact thing. Hopefully when that video was paused, you were able to refer to your notes. It's fine to refer to your notes at the beginning. I, I highly recommend it. Okay, it will just reinforce all the little details that are in your notes and how to apply them, right? How to apply them is the, the next big step. Copying these notes, even thinking that you understand them, is fine, but can you apply these without your notes? The thing is, with halogenation, we would attack with bromine and be done with it. Have two bromines on the molecule. Here we use water. Water, if you're wondering why water and not this bromide, uh, water is a solvent, so there's going to be vastly more water molecules available, and probability wise, water is going to attack. We already explained why water attacks the more substituted carbon, or why the nucleophile attacks the more substituted carbon. This is your, hmm, I almost said this is your final product. It's not your final product. Because when you have water as a nucleophile, just like with hydration, our last step is to remove that second hydrogen. We're going to use water again. Okay, we didn't create water in this step, so I do want to throw it over the arrow. And we have this. And we're done. In terms of stereochemistry, right? Again, no wedges and dashes in the mechanism, but if I had this as a fill in the product, you would realize that the only stereocenter you have is I keep saying stereocenter. The only chiral carbon you have is that carbon. This is a stereocenter. Uh, I just want to um, I just want to ensure you that. But stereocenter has more connotations than I want it to it to have. I'm just going to call this a chiral carbon. But all chiral carbons are also stereocenters. It's just that stereocenters have a, a broader definition and some examples that I'm not going to go over or ha I have not gone over. So we do have one chiral carbon. So if I ask you to draw the products with wedges and dashes when appropriate, you're going to have one molecule that has wedge, OH, and one molecule that has dash. No wedges and dashes here because that carbon is not chiral. So think about what we've done. We've done two reactions in this video, halogenation and halohydrin formation. The mechanism, they both start up the same. This one's region selected because you're adding two different things. But in both cases, 5C and 5D, you have anti-addition. So if you know that you made a chiral carbon, you have to apply what you know to make the correct wedge dash drawings. All right, that's video number two. And so far we've gone A, B, C, and D. We have four more reactions after that, and they are going to be even faster because now I think these these uh, terms are getting more and more familiar uh, to you all. All right, I'll see you in video three.